Good, ev good evening, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. This is the uh, third in a series of panels that we're putting on, uh, public forums to talk about marijuana policy, sponsored by the Sensible BC campaign. And the Sensible BC campaign is to work towards decriminalizing marijuana possession in British Columbia as the sensible first step towards a better marijuana policy in our province. And we're working towards that through a piece of legislation called the Sensible Policing Act. And we're hoping to have a referendum on this legislation in British Columbia next September in 2014. And to make that happen, we need to collect signatures from, from over 10% of the registered voters in every electoral district across British Columbia. And so uh, during the fall and earlier this year, I was on tour traveling around the province to over 50 cities and towns uh, in rural parts of the province, spreading the word about this campaign. And now we're doing this panel series. We've got a great uh, selection of speakers tonight and really a good selection at all of our panels, different crews at each one. And uh, so thanks for being here. We've also got some folks watching online as well, which is good. Um, so we're going to give each of our speakers about uh, 15 minutes or so to talk and then we will have a dialogue question and answer period for a while and we can discuss uh, marijuana policy or medical marijuana or whatever kind of interests uh, you might have tonight. Uh, but I want to thank our panel for being here and uh, without further ado I'll introduce our first speaker. Her name is Michael Vaughn. Uh, she's a lawyer and has been the policy director for the BC Civil Liberties Association since 2004. She's been an adjunct professor at UBC in the Faculty of Law and in the School of Library, Archival and Information Studies, where she has taught civil liberties and information ethics. She's a regular guest instructor for UBC's College of Health Disciplines interdisciplinary elective in HIV AIDS care and was honored as a recipient in the 2010 Accolades Award for Social and Political Advocacy Benefiting Communities with HIV AIDS. Ms. Vaughn is a frequent speaker on a variety of civil liberties topics, including privacy, national security, policing, surveillance, and free speech. And she is an advisory board member of Privacy International. So please join me now in welcoming Michael Vaughn. Thanks kindly. Nice to be here. So I'm going to focus a little bit on medical cannabis. But because of its broader ramifications, I want to talk a little bit about how the criminalization of cannabis affects and in fact distorts a huge range of critically important aspects of our lives, even if we don't personally use cannabis. So the um, item I'd like to bring to your attention is about the what I'm going to call the breakdown of our democratic process that is so elegantly illustrated by constitutional challenges in the medical marijuana field. So for background, Canada was either the first or certainly one of the very first among all countries in the world to constitutionally recognize a right to use medical cannabis for qualified patients. Canada apparently looking for some kind of penance for this inadvertent progressivism decided that it would develop the worst medical cannabis regime on the planet. And it has worked very, very hard to maintain those high-low standards ever since, I assure you. So democracy, as everybody knows, means nothing if it doesn't mean shared power. We must share power. We have checks and balances to share that power. And one of our mechanisms for sharing power is known as the dialogue between the courts and the legislature. So you may have heard or read in the newspaper when there is a constitutional challenge that goes up to the Supreme Court of Canada or even a lower court, the court may be, we may describe this as striking down legislation. Those judicial courtiers are deciding what our laws will be. That's the criticism. But in fact, that's not what courts do. They don't write the laws. They just say whether or not the legislature is coloring within the lines. We have certain rules, certain parameters that are our rights. So when a provision is struck down, it's not the court that says, here's how you got it wrong, here's the words to put in instead. It just says, this is out of bounds. And it goes back to the legislature to craft an appropriate response. So this is, as I say, the dialogue 
between the courts and the legislature. It's supposed to be a conversation. Now, as you know, when you're having a conversation, it doesn't work so well if one party to the conversation has their hands over their ears singing, la, 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 I can't hear you, um, which is indeed the response of the legislature to medical cannabis constitutional challenges. A history of contemptuous replies in this dialogue, which in my submission is simply gobsmacking. To give you an example, in the medical marijuana access program as it has existed, the ability to get medical cannabis for qualifying patients is three-pronged. You have three options. You can use the Health Canada um, uh, product, you can grow your own medical cannabis if you are licensed, or you can designate a grower. Now the initial number of people that as a designate, designated grower that you could grow for was one. One. Okay? Very hard to achieve economies of scale. Very hard to get widespread access to people who need someone to grow their medical cannabis for them. Not everyone has the ability to do this, of course. You need a designee more often than not. Very hard to find these people if they're only able to grow for one. So unsurprisingly, some patient had to take this on, had to go to court, spend years of their life and money they did not have or find pro bono lawyers also looking to contribute to this dialogue. To take this discussion into court and get a pronouncement from the court. And the court said, of course, no, one is not reasonable access. So this is what it was. What did the legislature respond in terms of their dialogue? How about two? Okay. That's as close to as an extension of a middle digit as a response as you can possibly imagine. That is obviously a response that is colored and forced through the lens of how we view the entire spectrum of cannabis in Canada, which is through the lens of criminalization. And that colors everything that we do when we deal with patients or otherwise. So it is not merely around who can grow medical cannabis that we see this distortion of our democratic processes and our dialogue. We see it in another case that actually would be funny if only <laughs> it weren't true, the Smith case in Victoria. So in the Smith case, you had, again, another patient taking time out of their life, lawyer bringing the case to court, money resources, to argue that the regulation that prevents anyone who's using medical cannabis for using anything other than dried cannabis, okay, so dried cannabis, you can't put it in a tincture, you can't bake it in a muffin, can't apply it topically, it because you can't with, med uh, with dried cannabis. So um, if you're just walking this through in your head for a moment, unless you have a $500 vaporizer hanging around, I don't know if you do, maybe in the back of your cupboard, you know where you keep all those Christmas gifts you haven't used in for a while, the waffle maker, the juicer, the vaporizer, in case you have one. No, you don't, you don't have one. Okay, I don't have one either. So that would mean that if I were using medical cannabis, I would have to smoke it, okay? Health Canada mandates that if you need this medication, you must smoke. Health Canada mandates that you must smoke. What is wrong with this picture, right? What is wrong with this picture is that we are crazed with the sense that we must at all cost avoid diversion. Why? Because we're viewing this through the lens of criminalization. Because we would rather throw patients under the bus, then admit then that looking at this plant as if it were, I don't know, plutonium, and needed that degree of security, we would rather do that than do something sensible, appropriate, proportionate, and put this in its proper frame. That is the distortion of criminalization. So now, in the medical cannabis picture, 
we have a new set of regulations after more than a decade of finding the current program unconstitutional. It is in my submission has never been lawful if the Constitution is the supreme law of the land. We have a new set of regulations. And the new set of regulations, in fairness, has a couple of good points. Certainly, um, getting Health Canada out of the um, licensing business so that you can be prescribed directly by a healthcare provider is a great improvement. But the heart of the new program will be that no one is going to be able to grow medical cannabis for themselves. No one will be a designated grower. Health Canada is getting out of the business altogether, and there will be licensed commercial growers. And those licensed commercial growers are anticipated to be selling medical cannabis for a certain price. And if you look at Health Canada's backgrounder on what they expect will be the result of this, the result will be, in terms of the price that they're expecting medical cannabis to fetch, that approximately 30% of patients right off the bung will not be able to afford this. We are looking at prices for people who need to use cannabis medication daily at somewhere between $500 and $2,500 a month. Certainly no one who is actually living on a disability income would be able ever to afford such medication. And this is not an unanticipated consequence. The very backgrounder that Health Canada is preparing to um, outline the impact of these regulations specifies that this is what's going to happen. Again, how do we end up with this crazed distortion on what should be happening here? How do we end up with medication that we can't actually provide to sick people because of the lens of criminalization. How do we end up at this place? We end up at this place because we've absolutely refused to look at this sensibly, rationally, and even pretend that we can regulate this appropriately. So the time is long, long past, and it affects not only um, possession in the ways that Sensible BC is suggesting, obviously a fantastic first step, but it echoes throughout a whole raft of different arenas, including how we treat patients and indeed how we view our democratic processes. So high time, that's what we say. We're all for it. Thanks very much. Thank you, Michael. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Evan Wood. Dr. Evan Wood is a clinical epidemiologist and internal medicine physician at St. Paul's Hospital, where he is the director of the Urban Health Research Initiative and an attending physician on the clinical teaching unit. He's also a professor of medicine at UBC, where he holds the university's Canada Research Chair in Inner City Medicine. Dr. Wood has published over 300 peer-reviewed studies and is funded by the National Institute on Drug Abuse. He has made a range of groundbreaking research contributions and received Physician of the Year Award in 2010 from the British Medical Journal for a study demonstrating that HIV treatments can prevent the spread of HIV among intravenous drug users. Dr. Wood is a member of Stop the Violence BC and he's a supporter of Sensible BC and that's why he's here and join me in welcoming Dr. Evan Wood. All right, uh, nice to be here, yeah, thank you so much. Um, I guess uh, the most difficult thing that uh, I deal with is um, that in my day job, uh, it's not uncommon that um, I'm treating some of the most sick people in our society, people from the downtown east side who end up at St. Paul's Hospital. Um, one of my least favorite things to do is um, tell people that they've acquired HIV infection through their drug use. Um, Probably my least favorite thing is telling uh, parents that their loved one has suffered a, a hypoxic brain injury from a non-fatal drug overdose. Um, so on the sort of spectrum of um, libertarianism, I actually feel that our government has a very uh, strong role to play uh, in controlling drugs. Um, 
but I, I had an experience back in 2009 where I was working uh, at Vancouver General Hospital actually where on three occasions in one month people who uh, had been shot in gang violence were brought into the emergency room. And I almost fell out of my chair when I saw this poll um, which concluded that two-thirds of British Columbians uh, would just go ahead and legalize marijuana if it would reduce violence. And many of the interventions that we were involved with in preventing and treating HIV in the downtown east side, which to put in perspective have resulted in a 90% reduction in new HIV infections in the downtown east side, don't enjoy anywhere near um, two-thirds support. And as I observed this over time, and I was looking at the media, it became increasingly obvious that the public was ahead of where many politicians were. And they were recognizing that, just like with alcohol prohibition, um, we were seeing some unintended consequences here. And then this became a bit of a fascination of mine, and I stumbled across this article, and I think it's really important to make clear that this isn't a political issue. This was the Fraser Institute, which I think everybody here will know is essentially a, a right-wing think tank. Um, their economists looked at this issue and they figured that the marijuana industry in BC was between, uh, was worth anywhere between two and seven billion dollars annually. And you can see what they concluded, that if we treat it like any other commodity, we can tax it, regulate it, and use the resources the industry generates, rather than continue a war against consumption and production that has long since been lost. And, and that's coming from the Fraser Institute. So it, it basically created an interest in me looking at these laws and issues and, and really seeing is this something that can really be explained by the laws themselves and rather attributed to the psychoactive properties of the drug. So I think everybody there would recognize um, Al Capone um, and we're all familiar with the experiment in the 1920s when alcohol was made illegal and what happened as a result of that. But we saw images like this where you had police with their sort of prize uh, from this cat and mouse game of trying to suppress the alcohol market and today we have the same thing. This is actually a photograph taken from just up the hill here where there's some well-meaning police officers with their prize having uh, cut down some marijuana plants that someone was trying to grow in West Vancouver. And there's other issues that um, are exactly the same. So people are probably familiar with the stories of people going blind or dying from methyl alcohol because of the government's efforts to push people away from using ethyl alcohol in um, wood products and other things and people trying to make illicit alcohol. Um, well, we have the same thing today with because this is an unregulated market, um, we don't know what's in it, we don't know how strong it is, um, there's no regulations at all applied to this industry. And what's particularly interesting is that it's not just physicians that are beginning to talk uh, about this issue, but as soon we'll be hearing from a, a career law enforcement officer. And, and one of the key concerns of law enforcement has been the violence related to this industry. And if you look back at what happened with alcohol prohibition, you can see that Al Capone and, and all the violence that ensued in the wake of police taking out key producers of alcohol, creating an economic opportunity for others to fight to gain or maintain that market share. And of course, look at what happened with uh, the homicide rate when alcohol was legalized. In the United States, the homicide rate actually has a bimodal distribution where it went up and then down after alcohol prohibition ended. But then under the war on drugs, the homicide rate went up again. I always like to speak from a very evidence-based perspective and I, and I do so openly now because a PhD student from my lab did something called a systematic review and in uh, evidence-based healthcare we have something called evidence-based medicine where our decision making has to be based on evidence and at the top of that pyramid of evidence-based medicine is something called the systematic review where you look at all the studies that have ever been published on a topic, what's the best antibiotic, what's the best heart disease medi medication, we make those decisions based on a systematic review. So we thought we'd do a systematic review of all the studies that have been done looking at how much does increasing funding for drug law enforcement uh, impact upon violence? And there's no, we looked at every single English language study that had ever considered this issue. 
There's no single study that has ever shown that increasing drug law enforcement reduces violence, and there's all sorts of studies showing that when you take off the, a, a dealer off the corner or a cartel member out in Mexico, there aren't lawyers for, or other conventional dispute resolution mechanisms, and people turn to violence to try and exploit the ec economic opportunities that are presented. And even the police that are advocating for more resources to you know, continue the status quo are essentially the, saying the same thing that, that, that law enforcement against prohibition or, or myself uh, and the Health Officers Council of British Columbia is saying is that this industry is contributing to a huge amount of harm. And it's not just organized crime in terms of you know, the outlaw motorcycle gangs and others that are involved, but it's just all the disorganized crime that's, that's related to this. Um, these are our, our high school students, and I thought I'd point this out because um, we're speaking in a high school tonight, that were killed as part of um, gang activity out in Abbotsford in a, in a drug thing gone bad. This is, um, I don't know if this was, uh, yeah, February 27th, so this is about I don't know, five or six days ago, someone murdered in a grow-up. We've just sort of accepted this as, as a way of life in British Columbia, and nobody's really talking about it, that, um, of course, uh, that really, just as was it the case with alcohol prohibition, all the grow-ups and the home invasions, the hydro theft, the gang activity is a natural consequence of marijuana prohibition that exists because of the laws that we've put in place. And there's a couple of things we could do. We could increase law enforcement, and that's an experiment that has been tried extensively in the United States, and we've just uh, passed, uh, as part of the omnibus crime bill here, a scenario where people will go to prison for a mandatory prison term if they're caught with more than six marijuana plants. It doesn't matter if they're this big, if you've got six or more, you'll do a mandatory prison term. If you look at the impact of this in the United States, uh, as was done here, um, these laws are extremely effective at putting people in prison. And, and it's been estimated now that about a trillion dollars has been spent in the last 40 years on the war on drugs, locking people up in this cat and mouse game of trying to prevent people from using drugs. You can imagine the costs here, um, you know, about $80,000 to lock someone up and feed them in prison, times 500,000 people, You've got all the police and judges and lawyers and all the costs to do that. Then people are out on parole. Um, you couldn't even work as a janitor in this school if you had a felony conviction for marijuana possession. So we're, we're really ruining people's lives and spending a huge amount of money to do so. And it, this is how it manifests in our society, you know, this cat and mouse game between people who use drugs and the police trying to prevent people from doing that. In the United States, it's uh, been particularly ethnic minorities that have been affected by this. Um, it's estimated that about one in eight African American males between the ages of 20 and 35 are incarcerated on any given day, about one in eight. Um, obviously, the numbers are much huger when you look at uh, people under correctional control outside of that. More African American males in correctional control than there were under slavery before the Civil War. So what's been the impact of this? Um, this is um, the National Institutes on Drug Abuse. It's the arm of the US government that looks at the drug problem and what we should do about drugs. Um, you can imagine that they're kind of conservative because it's, it's from the US government, um, but they fund uh, research around the world looking at this question and they're evidence-based in what they do. And you can see that they've concluded that over the last 30 years of cannabis prohibition, the drug has remained almost universally available to American 12th graders, with approximately 80 to 90 percent saying the drug is easy to obtain. Other studies show that young people have easier access to cannabis than alcohol and tobacco. So think of the grow-ups and the home invasions and the cost of locking people up and ruining their lives, and what are we actually accomplishing? If we were efficiently suppressing this market, and I'm not an economist, but I have friends who are, we would expect that the price of marijuana would be going up and the potency, because the quality is getting worse because people aren't able to efficiently grow it, that the potency would be going down. But if you look at the government's uh, own data, this is US government data who tracks these issues, 
you can see that the price of marijuana has gone down dramatically. And that's not because marijuana is of worse quality, but the potency of marijuana has gone up exponentially. So this whole effort has just been miraculously unsuccessful. So this led to myself and others uh, uh, who are big supporters of what Sensible BC is doing, and that's why I'm here today, to form to uh, a group called Stop the Violence BC. Uh, that's the cover of our first report, which was entitled Breaking the Silence, because um, although there have been people, I see Jody Emery's here, and, and people like Dan Larson that have been talking about these issues, um, really as a province we've been burying our head in the sand and in many cases uh, people joke about BC bud and, and marijuana industry in BC but they haven't drawn the links between all the problematic aspects of it. We're a coalition of experts from across BC, um, four former attorneys general, a range of mayors, uh, the provincial medical health officer of BC, um, a range of individuals from law enforcement including one who you'll hear from shortly and our goals are quite simple. We're trying to start a conversation in BC about the failure of supply reduction, the harms of, uh, of, of the prohibition model, and the potential value of taxing and regulating marijuana. And this is a, a simple uh, uh, figure that um, in my role as the, uh, uh, with the Health Officers Council of British Columbia, we often talk about. So you can see social problems increase uh, on the y-axis there. That certainly is the case with the illegal market. Um, were we to take marijuana and not try to control it in the way we've done with tobacco and we allow for advertisement and promotion and we don't worry if young people use it and we don't worry about drug impaired driving, we could see increased uh, harms as well. But there is something in the middle and I think that is what the end game is uh, for Sensible BC is to regulate this industry and place controls around it and we know from the tobacco research and from the alcohol research that how we regulate these substances, and I can elaborate on this a little bit um, during the question and answer, we have huge potential to actually wage economic war on organized crime and make cannabis less available to young people and totally get rid of all the grow ops and all the, the problems that we're dealing with now. I thought I'd share some of the data from a recent Angus Reid poll. You can see 12% of British Columbians are, uh, uh, want to see the existing marijuana laws left unchanged. So about 1 in 10 uh, people think the laws are working. Uh, you might be sitting there saying, well, maybe some people want to see us crack down uh, more aggressively. But you can see um, that basically, sorry, back one, uh, you can see about 80% of people disagree with marijuana possession leading to a criminal record. So how out of step are our politicians with the public when 80% of people disagree that this should cause you a criminal record, whereas if you know, you're a young person caught at Ambleside later tonight, you could be saddled for the rest of your life with a criminal record. What's really interesting is that 75% of British Columbians think that chasing and arresting marijuana producers and sellers is ineffective and that we'd be better off taxing and regulating the adult use of marijuana. I thought I'd just um, end with this last slide because um, it, this has been in the news a lot and I think the public is way ahead of politicians but it's quite interesting is that even in relatively conservative West Vancouver um, you can see the conclusions uh, from the North Shore News in the last paragraph of this editorial we call on our MPs John Weston and Andrew Saxton to help figure out a new substance policy that doesn't subsidize gangs and doesn't wreck people's lives. So, um, you know, thank you for Sensible BC for organizing this and for you for coming out because I think it is something that we do need to break the silence on and, and, and really have more of a conversation about. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Evan. Our next speaker is Sanjita Lali. She's been an active member of the Liberal Party of Canada since 2008. Since then, she has held various positions within the party and ran as a candidate during the 2011 federal election. Sanjita has been actively working on a policy to legalize, tax, and regulate marijuana and co-authored a policy working paper for the Liberal Party, developing a framework for this policy. Join me in welcoming Sanjita Lali.
Thanks, Dana, and uh, thank you, uh, thank you to all of you for coming out tonight uh, and being a part of this very important discussion. Uh, I'm here to present a policy paper written by the Liberal Party of Canada in BC that Dana just referenced to uh, on the legalization of marijuana, which provides answers to commonly asked questions and develops a framework for future policy, policy initiatives. Uh, I believe we're at a point where we no longer need to discuss why we need to legalize marijuana, we need to start discussing how we're going to do it, uh, especially based off of the numbers that uh, Dr. Wood, Wood just introduced to us. Uh, the paper was developed out of a policy resolution that was introduced by the Young Liberals of Canada at our 2012 policy convention in Ottawa, uh, and this was to legalize and regulate marijuana. Uh, they wrote this resolution because millions of Canadians today regularly consume marijuana. Uh, countless billions of dollars are spent on ineffective uh, or incomplete enforcement. Uh, the Senate and the House of Commons have previously looked into uh, different types of marijuana policy reform at uh, different points throughout the last de few decades. And marijuana provides a significant resource for gang-related gang uh, violent criminal activity and weapon smuggling. Uh, this resolution, sorry, yeah, we are on the right page. Uh, this resolution uh, also states that a new Liberal government will legalize marijuana and ensure the regulation and taxation of its production, distribution, and use. Uh, invest significant resources in prevention and education programs, extend amnesty to all Canadians who were previously convicted, uh, convicted of uh, minimal or simple uh, possession, and uh, work with provinces and local governments on a coordinated uh, regulatory approach to marijuana. Now, the support for this was uh, quite significant, especially within the party. Uh, those who attended the uh, convention as delegates, about 80% voted in favor of going forward with this policy. Uh, there was also uh, quite a bit of support from community leaders, as well as 66% of Canadians favor the legalization or decriminalization of marijuana. And we even had media on board on this one. Uh, I believe it was Ian Mulgrew who we quoted at the bottom there saying, uh, hallelujah, Canadians agree it's time to legalize marijuana. Uh, now the goal of this paper is to uh, answer common questions that we've heard and we've split it up into five different categories including policy, uh, international response, legal, public health, and logistics. Uh, we answered 36 questions in total, but I will only be going over a few of them today since we only have a few minutes. Uh, but you're more than welcome to go to bc.liberal.ca and you can uh, take a look at it in full detail. Okay, so we'll start off with the most common question that we were asked, and that is, uh, would a system of partial legalization like decriminalization be optimal instead? And our answer is no. And this is because decriminalization of small amounts would lead to a system where it's legal to possess, but not to supply. Uh, without legalizing production, sale, and consumption at the same time, organized crime will continue, and that'll just leave our uh, law enforcement in limbo. Uh, one of the biggest benefits of legalizing marijuana would be its economic e impact and economic benefits. Uh, the government would be able to tax marijuana if it was legalized, uh, and also collect money from uh, those who are licensed to sell it. Uh, in November 2012, SFU published a paper that stated BC may generate $2.5 in government tax and licensing revenue over five years. And that's within our province alone. Uh, nationally, RAND reported in 2009 that uh, the Canadian, uh, the Canadian uh, government would bring in 3 to $4 billion. Uh, and this is based on a market of 3 million annual consumers. Uh, other benefits include uh, the reallocation of law enforcement, as well as correction, border, and justice resources. Uh, and this would just lead to a better use of taxpayer money. And there would also be a significant increase in jobs through a marijuana industry. Uh, a few of the opportunities, including agriculture, technology, energy, specialty retail stores, transportation, and the list goes on. Now one of the biggest problems we have today is the black market. Uh, it's making our streets uh, dangerous for all Canadians, whether someone is a user or not. Uh, and while ending prohibition won't actually end organized crime, uh, it would put a significant dent in it. 
Uh, that being said, uh, the black market sales of illegal alcohol and tobacco uh, weren't really a problem post-prohibition, and we do think that that's going to continue with marijuana. Now, to prevent a marijuana black market from re-emerging, uh, the new framework suggests that we uh, ensure the legal price is lower than it is now, and that the quality is either better or equal to what it is at the moment. Uh, ensure, packaging, uh, in ensure that packaging reflects consumer demand and that the product is accessible for all adults. Uh, establish a zero tolerance policy on import and export. Uh, increase criminal penalties for export and unregulated uh, suppliers. And allow opportunities for Canadians to grow marijuana within their own homes for personal use. Uh, now, another problem uh, that's crime-related within the country is uh, what's happening internationally. Uh, Canada's marijuana industry has been connected to uh, violent drug cartels in Mexico, uh, South America, as well as Central America. Uh, over here we have uh, four different stories. Oh, sorry, just back one. We have four different stories that came out in 2012 alone. Uh, one of the biggest stories was uh, brought out in April, on April 18th, 2012, uh, which stated that uh, marijuana was being grown in BC, being taken down to uh, Mexico and uh, to Central and South America, and being traded for cocaine and guns, which were being brought back up here. So we were uh, sending down a relatively harmless product and bringing back something that was a lot more harmful. Now, what would be the... Uh, penalties for those who operated outside of the legal system and did things like smuggling uh, guns and cocaine into the country. Uh, we believe that uh, once marijuana is legal, there should be tougher penalties and sentences uh, and that they would be justified for those operating outside of the legal system. Now, I kind of hinted at this uh, earlier, but uh, next question is, will people be able to grow it within their homes? Uh, we think that they should be able to. Uh, and we don't think that the uh, interest will be too extensive on this one, especially if marijuana is uh, available uh, easily throughout the country. However, we don't think, we don't think that it should be banned. Uh, Colorado is planning to impose a limit of six plants per person as a part of their legalization plan. Uh, and we believe a maximum number of plants for personal use uh, should be decided by provinces and municipalities and shouldn't be decided by the federal government itself. And I don't really have a transition between uh, this and public health, so I'll just start talking about it. Uh, when it comes to public health, we need to know how many people actually use the product. We have a few numbers from uh, the last couple of years. Uh, in 2005, the UN estimated that 17% of the population in Canada aged between 15 and uh, 64 use marijuana. And that's among some of the highest rates in the world. Uh, this translates to about 3 million uh, Canadians uh, using marijuana each year. Uh, and in 2007, Health Canada reported that 8.2% of young Canadians use marijuana on a daily basis. Uh, now, this is a very important number. Uh, we really like stressing this number because uh, it shows just how easy it is for youth to get it and just how many young people use the product. Uh, it is a lot, uh, the health effects on youth are a lot more significant than they would be on adults. Uh, we do believe that it should be restricted on youth, and when it comes to the minimum age of smoking marijuana uh, in this legal framework that we're introducing, we believe that uh, you should be either 19 or 18 uh, to purchase marijuana yourself. Uh, the age would be based on whatever the drinking age would be within each province. Uh, now, some of the public health benefits to legalizing marijuana would be that it would make it uh, easier to prohibit youth access, uh, we would be able to ensure marijuana is grown in a controlled and regulated setting uh, with strict labeling provisions to better protect consumers as well as producers. Uh, we would be delivering billions of dollars in new revenue that government can reinvest in public health care, including mental illness, treatment, education, and awareness initiatives. Uh, we would be encouraging the private sector and academic organizations to expand research into health impacts. 
Uh, we'd be forcing fewer Canadians to live with stress and stigma associated with having a criminal record for doing something that three million, Amer uh, th sorry, three million Canadians do on a yearly basis. And we would be increasing the availab availability of marijuana for those who need marijuana for medical purposes. Uh, now, would a legalized system reduce or increase the number of consumers? Uh, there is little evidence to suggest that uh, consumption rates will rise dramatically, uh, especially if marijuana is legalized, uh, particularly, particularly sorry, since cannabis is not as addictive as most drugs. Uh, some doctors and researchers have also stated that uh, regulating marijuana um, would probably reduce the rates instead of increasing them because there would be uh, regulations placed on it instead of letting it be uh, an open market. Now, some of the logistics behind legalizing marijuana, uh, such as pricing, point of purchase, and taxation. Uh, the prices do need to be lower than the current street level to prevent organized crime from uh, maintaining a black market. Uh, prices will differ based on each province, uh, and this would be based off of things like taxation as well as uh, importing within provinces. Uh, the, and people would be able to purchase marijuana uh, through specialty stores and uh, or anywhere regulated liquor sale, sales take place since there is already a framework in liquor stores to be selling uh, these types of products. And this would also help to ensure that uh, minors can't come into contact with it. Uh, and if Canadians were to follow a similar mo model to Washington, uh, Canadian businesses and nonprofit organizations would need to staff uh, over 2,700 2, retail locations to serve Canadians, um, or at least the 3 million consumers. And an annual government revenue in Canada from legalized marijuana based on 3 million annual consumers would likely exceed $4 billion per year. And that's off of a tax rate of 30 to 35% which is uh, what we suggested in our paper. Uh, now, we would like everybody to note that that is a lower tax rate than uh, tobacco uh, throughout most of the provinces in the country. Uh, now, quality and production control are definitely going to have to be a significant part of whatever the new fl legal framework would be. Uh, a new framework should include comprehensive provisions to ensure quality control based on standards for tobacco, alcohol, and hemp production. Uh, and there should be compliance with municipal uh, bylaws as well as business licensing provisions. Uh, these guidelines should allow for various levels of THC, other ca cannabinoid content, and uh, cannabis strains. And the market should be open to a large range of Canadian businesses from very small farms to medium size and large scale operations. Uh, there will be a discretion regarding purchasing of marijuana, sorry, discretion regarding uh, purchasing of marijuana rests primarily with uh, entities that have been licensed and, and uh, licensed by provinces to sell it. Uh, so there will have to be a licensing system and you will have to get a license to actually sell it yourself. But again, people should, will be able to grow marijuana within their ho own homes for their own personal use. Uh, now, to summarize, uh, the five best reasons to end the current prohibition are to fight organized crime. Uh, there would be a significant new revenue uh, that will support important government services. Uh, the current laws do more harm than they do good. Uh, legal drugs like alcohol and tobacco are just as harmful, if not more so. And there would be a commitment to evidence-based policy, policy instead of political ideology. Uh, governments across the board would have to work together, but the federal government needs to take the lead, which is why the Liberal Party is introducing this uh, now, and hopefully by 2015, we'll have a full policy to introduce in an election platform. Uh, this, would also invest, this will also help to invest funds raised by taxes towards social programs, education for youth, public health care, and shift legal and public safety resources towards more harmful, uh, harmful drugs and towards trafficking. Moving forward, uh, we do encourage everybody to read this paper at bc.liberal.ca. Uh, and we are currently in the draft process. This is just our first draft here. Uh, we are working on our second one very soon. So please do email your comments uh, to info at lpcbc.com uh, and let us know what you think. And start the discussion with everybody that you know so that we can uh, get the best, best policy put forward before the next election comes. Thank you.
that to her right there. You don't need, it's a man who needs no introduction. <laughs> or, exactly. or maybe someone else took it. There we go. All right. Yeah. But actually, you raised some interesting points there about the regulatory system that would come into place. And I'm good to see that that dialogue is continuing and you're looking for more feedback. There's a lot of aspects to cannabis regulation in terms of foods and extracts and things like that that also need to be looked at. But I really I hadn't heard your presentation before, so I really enjoyed, uh, enjoyed hearing that. Um, our final speaker tonight is uh, Cash Heed. He graduated from the BC Police Academy in 1979 and has spent the past 30 years serving the public in law enforcement. He began his career as an officer with the Vancouver Police Department, where he moved through the ranks of constable, detective, sergeant, inspector, and superintendent. During that time, he completed his BA and MA at Simon Fraser University. In 2007, Cash was appointed chief of the West Vancouver Police Department. In 2009, he was elected MLA for Vancouver Fraser View, serving a number of positions, including Minister of Public Safety and Solicitor General. He now lives in Richmond with his wife and daughter. Please join me in welcoming Cash Heed. Thank you. Thank you. It's uh, certainly great to be here um, today, now that I screwed up the microphone. But I just got to tell a bit of a story because we've listened to some great experts here. I, I don't think I've got much more to contribute, so I'll tell some really good cop stories. First story I want to tell is the last time I was actually in the K-Meek Center, is when I was sworn in as the chief constable for the West Vancouver Police Department. It was in this very building on this very stage, so I'm very happy to be back to talk about something just as important as me being the chief constable, and that's uh, marijuana regulation. But I gotta tell you, that day when I was walking uh, from the parking lot where we parked to, uh, to come to the event, the swearing in, of course I walked by the uh, smoke pit for the uh, senior secondary school here. And, you know, having grown up uh, back in the uh, 60s, 70s and going to school, yeah, when you went by smoke pits, you smelled uh, tobacco. Well, going by this smoke pit, guess what I could smell? Marijuana. So certainly, um, this is a uh, timely issue. Uh, I want to thank Sensible BC for moving the matter forward here in BC. I want to uh, thank Dr. Wood for all the work he did uh, and continues to do was Stop the Violence. Uh, he was the key individual that got me involved in uh, speaking out and speaking my mind. And you're going to hear a little bit more about uh, me speaking my mind after we watch a video uh, that was done by Pete McCormack, uh, a film producer, an absolutely fantastic individual. And he took uh, two and a half hours of us sitting down and talking about drug issues and my career in policing and in politics, and he's condensed it to about four and a half minutes. So let's watch that first, and then I'll say a few words. Shootings and gang violence have grown exponentially in recent years. We are not having any success on marijuana prohibition in Canada. My mother said to me uh, when I was very, very young, do the right thing, not the popular thing. It's very difficult for police officers to come out and say that the war on drugs has been a failure. From day one in the academy, we were taught as police officers that the way to deal with problems is to arrest people and put people in jail. And even myself as a young officer, starting in 1979, believed that we could arrest our way out of this particular problem. But over the years, as I went forward in my law enforcement career, um, I realized that years and years and years of spending money on enforcing prohibition for drugs uh, has been a failure. And that is the feeling with many, many police leaders, but they publicly will not say it until they leave policing because the culture will eat you up. And I have experienced this. They labeled me as not being one of them as being an advocate 
for the drug user. Drug dealers are regulating marijuana right now. It's easier for our youth right now to go out and buy marijuana than it is to purchase alcohol and cigarettes. We need to start thinking long term. Number one is dealing with the issue of marijuana and ending prohibition and taxing the revenue that can come from marijuana. There is absolutely no way we will deal with our drug problems, with our current policies, simply because there is far too much money to be made selling illicit drugs in this world. When I was a commanding officer of the drug unit, we had record-breaking interdiction uh, of drugs here in Vancouver. We had record-breaking arrests. And we quickly realized that it did not make one iota a difference, and the price did not change by one cent. And we found an increase in violence simply because the void has to be filled. People will get involved in the trade to make a lot of money because it is still illegal. The great demand for marijuana produced in British Columbia is the United States. So if the gangs can get their product to the United States, they can use that money to purchase cocaine to bring it back here into BC to even triple their profits. It's criminal organizations that are benefiting from uh, the prohibition of drugs, especially the prohibition of marijuana here in British Columbia. The gang situation in Metro Vancouver is very, very serious. And we've had an excess of 300 people killed uh, based on this uh, uh, prohibition of marijuana and the fact that they're getting involved in it to make some easy money. And uh, they're not going to think twice about uh, taking out someone in order for them to make more of a profit. If we continue with our current drug policies in Canada, we will have an increasing rate of gang violence in our communities. I'm in the political world right now. The hypocrisy is rampant. We, as citizens of Canada, need to stand up and advocate for contemporary drug policies. Let's end marijuana prohibition. Let's stop the violence that's taking place here in British Columbia. Let's end it now by ending prohibition. Sometimes it's nice just to show that video and sit back down and listen to your questions. Thank you. Uh, often people say, how difficult was it for you to uh, get out there and speak your mind on this particular issue, especially having spent so many years in law enforcement and trying to change your mind to think like all of them? Well, the answer I give to them is just listen to my comments in the media about the political environment right now and you'll understand that it's very easy for me to speak out on matters that are certainly close to my heart. But I want to touch on a, a couple of highlights here before we open it up to questions. And uh, Mikhail uh, talked about the medicinal uh, marijuana regulations in Canada and I remember them very well when Alan Rock brought them into Canada and uh, we thought, uh, or put them in place in Canada, we thought they were very contemporary at the time. And the reason I'm so familiar with it is I was a commanding officer of the drug unit uh, with the Vancouver Police Department at that time. But w we had some concerns with respect to it. Uh, we continue to have some concerns. And I'm not sure uh, our political masters in Ottawa s still have it right. Uh, I think there's a lot that needs to be done on that, so I encourage you to continue to speak out with respect to medicinal marijuana. The other issue I want to highlight is the, uh, the gang violence. Um, when I was uh, in charge of dealing with some of the, uh, the gang problems here in Vancouver, 
and having to deal with some of the tragedies of notifying families at two o'clock in the morning that their son was lying dead on a slab of concrete in the morgue. Uh, it was difficult because uh, every time I walked in to the house to notify the family uh, on the mantle above the fireplace, and you, to this day, you will still see pictures of those children, and I'm calling them children when they were two years old, the most innocent, beautiful child, which is now dead, simply because he got involved in this gang warfare that's taking place in British Columbia. And the reason they got involved, it's simple, profit. It's easy to make money. This is a natural plant that's grown through various techniques. It was easy for these gang members to start growing it, to start selling it, to start transporting it, to get it to market, to bring back cocaine and guns from the United States and make even more money. These kids knew that their life most likely would be shortened because of it, but they were going to live it hard and fast. So with the 300, over 300 people just in the Indo-Canadian community that have been murdered because of their involvement in gangs, you can trace it back to the easy access to getting involved in the marijuana trade. And that's because of prohibition here in Canada. Some of the other things we found out when I was a commanding officer of the drug unit, and Evan uh, touched a little bit on this, is the paradoxical effect of enforcement. Where in fact, uh, when we took out massive supplies, when we interdicted massive supplies of drugs here in Vancouver, here in British Columbia, we found that crime increased. When we took out uh, drug traffickers, when we did, and I was in charge of those uh, record-breaking arrests in the downtown east side of Vancouver, where we would take off all these street-level drug traffickers. Matter of fact, I did my master's thesis on the arrest of 600 drug traffickers in the downtown east side of Vancouver. What we found after we arrested this group, after the roundup, that violence increased simply because the void was filled so easily and these people were battling for control of those particular locations to sell their, their product. So there was a paradoxical effect to our enforcement rates. Where I really started to uh, take a different um, attitude towards drugs, prohibition, enforcement, was when I testified in front of the uh, Senate committee in November 2001. Pierre Nolan's committee, I think many in this room will recall that, pretty well replicated what Ladane said in 1973. But let me tell you a little story and you'll understand uh, where I'm coming from. It was uh, about four days before the Senate committee was coming out to Vancouver and uh, the chief constable called me into his office and said uh, they would like a presentation from the Vancouver Police Department. So Terry Blythe, who was a good friend of mine, said, I'm not going to do it. I think you should do it. He said, fine. So I spent the entire weekend uh, getting together some notes on it. So I presented in front of the Senate committee, and uh, I made some remarks which became quite controversial. Matter of fact, I told them the truth. I said, uh, we're not uh, arresting anyone for simple possession in Vancouver unless there are extenuating circumstances. And I said that was for any, any drug, not just marijuana. It was for crack cocaine. It was for heroin. Simple possession. We weren't arresting them. And a few, made a few other comments, but oh my God. Next morning, headlines. Vancouver Sun, Vancouver Province is this remark that I made. But uh, what encouraged me to continue was Senator Pierre Nolan said that I had gone where no other law enforcement official in Canada has gone in making those bold, bold remarks about what we need to do here and why we're doing them. I just told the truth. <laughs> the 
And you have to understand the way the, the police culture is and, and the policies that are actually uh, put together and uh, protocols put in place uh, and understand that it's a culture of enforcement. Um, where we started to see a bit of a, a difference was when we went with the uh, supervised injection site, or at least talked about the supervised injection site here in Vancouver. And uh, um, it was difficult. I remember when I wrote a report for the Vancouver Police Board, and I said we should try it, trial it. And uh, boy, you wouldn't believe the resistance I met. The RCMP, even at that time, were coming at me saying that uh, if we were to open up an injection site in uh, Vancouver, uh, they would come in and they would shut it down. I says, well, why don't you come in this evening and shut it down? Because we have an injection site in Vancouver. It's called the South Lane of the 100 East Hastings, where it's a dirty, dark, and stinky lane where the addicts are getting their water from puddles, where they're discarding their needles, and they're overdosing in that lane. So why don't you come in and bust it right now? Because that's what we had in Vancouver at that time. And I remember uh, working with Donald McPherson, who I know as a supporter of Sensible BC, um, about what we needed to do and how we needed to change it. But I'll tell you, it was a long battle with Health Canada, with politicians, with enforcement agencies to get that injection site in place. And it's still there and it's saving lives here in Vancouver. And I took some heat from uh, John Walters. Did everyone know John Walters? Um, he was a drug czar in the United States. And uh, actually, I took him uh, into the Amsterdam Cafe. I took uh, Jody, you remember this? Um, I actually took John Walters. Here he is, the drug czar of the United States, had never been into a marijuana grow up. I took him into his first marijuana grow up here in Vancouver and explained to him exactly why we were involved in trying to remove these from the community because of the dangers in the community, because of the gang violence, the community violence that was taking place. And I remember touring him in the downtown east side and taking him into the Amsterdam Cafe. And I got to admit, although John Walters is, uh, you know, his, his ideology is far different from my ideology, he did listen at that time. Uh, but I don't think it changed much. But what we have going on in the United States right now, uh, we have to look at because as far as I'm concerned, they're further left than the Netherlands on their marijuana policy with Initiative 502 in Washington and Amendment 64 in Colorado, and the appearance of uh, Obama not taking some federal enforcement against them, I think we're going to see models that we should uh, look at uh, for Canada, for British Columbia, and uh, put those in place uh, as soon as we can. But I'm in this political world right now only for a couple more months. And I can tell you, trying to move um, policy in the political world is very, very difficult. When you look at the ideology with some of the politicians, you can understand why we don't have the contemporary policies in place. And when you look at, you would think, politicians look at polling all the time. They have people hired, paid hundreds, hundreds of thousands of dollars to look at polling continually. Well, all they have to do is look at some of the recent polling and see what the constituents want here in British Columbia, want elsewhere in Canada, and see that it's uh, a change to marijuana prohibition and have some realistic policies in place, some that's going to generate some tax dollars, some that's going to take away uh, the profits from some of the organized gangs out there, and, and uh, I'm sure that's going to do a loop right back to reducing the violence in our communities, and they'll understand uh, why they need to act on it. And that's my goal right now, and I can tell you it's an uphill battle trying to get the politicians to change. So we need all of you, we need these experts that are up here to continue to demand changes here in Canada because if you don't do it, I can tell you, don't sit back and wait for your governments to do it. You, the people of the province of BC and elsewhere in Canada, have to demand those changes. Thank you.
Uh, thank you very much. And that's exactly what this campaign is about. It's about bypassing our politicians and much of our political system and writing our own law and putting that law through ourselves. And certainly the Sensible Policing Act could be passed by any provincial government at any time. And we should be putting pressures on our MLAs to do so. But uh, I believe that ultimately a referendum is going to be what's required to get this legislation through. And that's what our campaign is about. Um, so we're going to open up the floor to questions. If you have any questions, we have two mics down here that you can use. Maybe just pull that one over a little bit. We've also got people watching online. And if there's any, I'm not sure where our online there he is. If got anybody has any good questions online, uh, feel free to let me know. But I'm actually going to ask, <coughs> I'm going to ask the first question myself, and it's to the panel, but especially to Cash Heed, is we've had polls showing support for this issue for many years now. And we've said how our politicians or how our citizens are seem to be ahead of our politicians on this issue. So what is the fear among our political leaders into adopting this issue? When we have polling showing 60, 70, 80 percent in support, why isn't there broad-based support among our political leaders? Why are they still afraid of this issue? Well, let me make, is my mic on? Yeah. Let me just make uh, uh, one particular comment. It's not, in our Liberal caucus, it's not all of them that are against it. There are an, a number of them, but they don't feel they want to go public at this time and actual support. Matter of fact, Joan McIntyre, who represents part of this riding here in West Van, did come out in support the regulation and taxation of marijuana. She did. There are others that actually feel that we need to have that. In my, uh, in my opinion, the, most of the politicians are still caught up in this uh, drug war metaphor where, in fact, uh, politicians, especially in the United States and elsewhere in Canada, actually get elected by this big tough-on-crime law enforcement perspective uh, versus actually listening to what the constituents want. But this is not unique to the drug issue. This is uh, certainly uh, part of other issues when we want to implement change here. They haven't heard enough from the public, Dana, to tell you the truth. Uh, they need to hear more directly from their constituents. Yes, it's great to have that polling uh, that uh, Evan actually referred to, but you've got to do more. You've got to keep on them continually in order for, them, for it to sink into them that we finally have to make changes. And when a provincial politician or a municipal politician says to you, well, it's out of our mandate, it's Ottawa, no. You're representing the constituents, even if you have to make the demands on Ottawa as a, a provincial MLA or an elected city councillor, that's your job to do, to work for your constituents. And, and why they would be maintaining these policies and costing us a billion dollars a year on policies that Ladane said before the Senate said, before you guys said, is failed, um, costing us more than it's, it's gaining us. In fact, there's no benefit. The Vienna Declaration pointed out that it increases the demand, it guarantees a, a regulated or unregulated black market with no protective uh, uh, mechanisms for people. Uh, it, it's at the root of the cost uh, of AIDS and disease in our society. It's at the root of petty crime and, and serious crime. Every time there's a gangster killed, it's at least a million dollars in investigative costs that we pay for. Uh, the, the, the biggest thing in, in Sangita, I'm so looking forward to the second draft. I hope that it encompasses a lot of the changes that we've talked about in the past. Uh, the first one that you're going with, uh, I could go on a long time about what I, I, you know, I love what you're doing, but there still needs to be some changes there. But, you know, my question is, is, Cash, what can we do, man? I mean, th these people, they're not just behind us because they don't get it. Uh, they're protecting interests that are not Canadians, that are not the public's. They're in contempt of the populace. They're criminally misusing these public funds. What can we do? I found out in these police stations I went to, the consensus was they don't feel, any of them, that they have jurisdiction to investigate the federal government. I'm told that in the criminal code, there's no, no provision for taking our public servants to task when they're corrupted and when they're, they're, they're servicing these private interests. That should be the first thing in our criminal code. So as a police officer, you know, I, I went to those police stations as just a citizen, a, a concerned civilian, and I get to that side of the desk and there's nothing else I can do but say, hey, you know what, here's evidence, there's a serious crime going on here in Canada and you guys have to do something about it and they say, well, we don't think we can do anything about it. So what can we do about it besides sensible BC? When are some police people going to go and arrest 
Harper and the Justice Minister for continuing these policies in the face of such evidence. Mm -hmm. Let me take it. When are you going to arrest Harper for us? You know, my, my hat's off to you for, for going to that length uh, to get them to change, but let's be realistic. They're, they're not going to do it. They're, they are not going to do it. It's a crime. That's why, that's why Sensible BC has a very good idea here. Stop the violence is a, a fantastic uh, reason why we need to change the drug laws, especially on marijuana. We can trace it back to many of the deaths and the gang warfare here in British Columbia. These are movements that are going to make the change, but my hat's off to you and to everyone, and I ended my presentation with saying it's got to be, the tipping point has to come from the people in Canada. It's, it's not going to change in your government. It's not going to change through your police uh, forces that you have. They're beholden to some, uh, some masters too, let's, let's face it. Uh, they're certainly supposed to represent the uh, communities they police. However, there are uh, hierarchies within these type of public services. So let's keep that in mind. Let's accomplish what we can and let's look for areas such as this to move this issue forward. Thank you, that's why I'm a supporter and thanks a lot for coming here. Thank you. Hello, my name is Ezra Bandel, and before asking my question, I just want to follow up because I've asked this question many times. Um, just what uh, Dina Larson asked, I really want to understand why is it that politicians look at the polls and see that there is a majority of support to change the law, and they don't do it. So it's being suggested that there are other interests behind this. What are these other interests? What is the real reason uh, why they don't do it? What are they afraid of? What, are, what do they have to lose? Because I don't think the question has been answered. What specifically is the reason? I'll, I'll just add to that that I don't think it's necessarily like a left or a right wing thing. I mean, I'm an NDP member and in our party certainly, just like in the Liberals, there's plenty of MLAs who support the issue, but it's not a top issue. The leadership doesn't want to talk about it. And I think both parties typically and provincially want to pass it off to the federal level. <clears throat> and federally, it's been a challenge as well. And I'm glad the Liberals have come out with a, with a solid policy in talking about cannabis. The challenge for the Liberals in any party is to maintain those ideals when they are in a position of power. And that when part of the closer, my experience has been the closer parties get to power, the less willing they are to talk about marijuana policy. And the further they are away, the more likely they are to bring it up. But, uh, but so I agree. That's, I don't know if you can talk about that anymore or if anyone else wants to address that. But uh, what it is about this issue that makes politicians afraid to follow majority view on this kind of stuff. Is there other things? I, I sometimes speculate they're afraid of the police because that certainly the RCMP has had an influence in different elections, federally and provincially. And, you know, sometimes, and, and when I'm debating or that, the only real big voice against these kind of things is typically the police, police institutions, not so much individual officers. And, uh, and I wonder if that's an issue or not. But anyways, I'll let the panel talk about that. You look like you wanted to say something, yeah. Sanjita. Uh, sorry. Um, I'll be, I'm going to be a little partisan here, I will admit that. Uh, the Liberals did introduce uh, policies on decriminalization and we're taking it forward to become a law, um, but things were scrapped uh, as soon as we lost the election. Um, and with the Conservatives, it's just, they're, they run on being tough on crime. And for them, legalizing marijuana is going to be something that's, it's going to be similar to them being soft on crime or at least in their opinion, when really it's just smart policy. Um, so hopefully in the future, things will change, but uh, it probably won't happen anytime soon. That's, that's just all I can say at this point. I'll, I'll just add that one of the things that I, I frequently hear, and I, I can't say that this is um, uh, what's at the bottom of your question, but lots of people have said, oh yes, well Canadians always feel that, but when push comes to shove, the US would never let us do it, right? This notion that somehow um, the US is going, it, the, the influence of the US is too um, omnipresent for us to ignore, which is what makes all of these um, new initiatives in various states so fascinating to watch. Because the question now is, insofar as that has been an excuse, if you will, legitimate or not legitimate, for a sovereign people, 
Um, but whether or not it has been, the, uh, the, the situation in the U.S. is clearly shifting. So uh, I'll just throw that on the table as something that I've heard. Evan? Yeah, I'll, I'll just reiterate. I think it, it is a real game changer what's happening in the United States right now. I think um, with Washington State and Colorado having legalized the adult use of marijuana and so many other states that are in deficit and huge issues with incarceration uh, in states. And if you just look at the trend line of public opinion around that, um, I honestly think that um, you know in the next several years, uh, the whole house of cards will come down with respect to cannabis. Um, I think the sensible BC, all of this has, has huge potential. And as Dana knows, it's gonna be the challenge to get 10% in every riding to have the referendum. Because I think if there's a referendum, then, then it will pass. It's the challenge to have that happen. There are other mechanisms, and I think you know it needs to be led by example. And one mechanism that is worth mentioning is that the Insight supervised injecting facility in the downtown east side was illegal when it was proposed and Canada is a signatory to international treaties that by law we have to make heroin, cocaine and marijuana illegal. But we have domestic legislation um, under a section 56 that can provide an exemption to those federal treaties and our domestic laws for research or medical purposes. So there's nothing stopping British Columbia doing something like the Insight experiment where a cannabis dispensary, for lack of a better word, um, was evaluated under a research umbrella and it would be ethically approved by universities and would have to ensure that it didn't cause problems in the neighborhood and contribute to organized crime. And so there are mechanisms, um, certainly our current federal government is not going to lead that effort, um, but there's a huge opportunity with, I think, this election with um, not only sensible BC, but, but things that BC could do. Um, I'll, I'll just say that the federal court, the Supreme Court decision around the Insight case was a unanimous Supreme Court decision that allowed Insight to remain open and created laws with that, that Section 56 exemption, or at least how the law should be interpreted, um, that the federal health minister doesn't have ultimate discretion over whether these exemptions are provided, but if there's a community that wants to do it and the stakeholders are on board, the minister is compelled to do so. So there's lots of change that could happen on a local level, um, and I agree with Cash, it has to happen at that level of individuals and researchers and police and others that might want to do it. I'll add something to that too, you know, the idea that we're always looking to the higher level of government to give us approval, so municipalities will look to the province, the province will say the federal government, the federal government will say it's the U.S., and the U.S. will point to international treaties. But I don't think it's going to come from the top down. These kind of changes always happen at the, at the lowest level of government first. So it's in, in BC, Vancouver has a different policy than most of the other province does in terms of laying possession charges for cannabis or things like the injection site. As Cash pointed out, possession charges are close to zero in Vancouver, whereas in the rest of the province they've been skyrocketing, uh, more than doubled over the past six years. And in California, before they passed their uh, referendum to have legalized medical marijuana access, it was the city of San Francisco that had a referendum to allow medical access. And before Washington State and Colorado passed their laws to legalize it, the cities of Seattle and Denver both had policies at the city level to make these changes happen. And so that's part of why I'm focusing on this campaign at the provincial level, because although our politicians will point to the federal government and say it's up to them, in reality, this is a provincial issue, a great deal of that. The provinces pay for the cost of prohibition, we pay for the enforcement, we pay for the police and the prisons, we pay most of the social costs of prohibition and ultimately the provinces like alcohol and tobacco under a legalized system while there'd be a room for federal legislation and federal regulation as well a lot of that falls to the provincial level when we had alcohol prohibition in Canada it wasn't done by the federal government each each province on their own decided whether or not they wanted to ban alcohol and Quebec was the last one in and the first one out of alcohol prohibition in Canada. And so we have a precedent for the idea that different provinces could have different kinds of marijuana laws and that BC could try and experiment here and have some kind of legalized system here. And we have a law, you can't bring your legal bud over the border to Alberta until they change their laws as well. So I think that's part of the model that we're working towards is bringing it up from the lower levels of government. If we try to start at the UN and get them to change their mind, it's not gonna happen. That'll be the last thing to change. After most countries have long ignored those treaties, that's when those treaties will finally get changed. Did you have anything else you wanted to add? Yeah, well, my main question, actually, 
um, like that, Health Canada said, well, we're going to appeal that, but also fine, you can just make it yourself. We're not going to provide it to you and no one else can help you do it. And so I think that's a, a very sad state of affairs because a lot of patients, I mean, smoking can be good medicine, but a lot of patients would prefer not to smoke their cannabis and they don't really have that option unless they make it themselves or they buy it from a dispensary or from the underground market. But uh, there's also the middle ground between synthetic preparations and smoking whole cannabis of extra whole plant extracts that are at a standardized dosage but that involve the whole plant and not a synthetic cannabinoid. And I think that's probably where the market would go under legalization. I think if cannabis was fully legalized and integrated, products like creams and salves would become very popular. They have very little or no psychoactivity. They can be used on a wide range of ailments of people of any age. And I think that other extracts and whole plant extracts would become more popular as well with dialed in cannabinoid levels to meet the needs of the patient. So some people prefer, might need CBD instead of THC for their particular ailment or a different ratio of cannabinoids. But unfortunately in Canada and the US, doing research on whole plant medicine is very difficult. The American government restricts it greatly and if they do let you do studies, they only provide you with very low quality marijuana grown in Mississippi, which is uh, notoriously swaggy. And uh, Canadian, the only legal source of cannabis in Canada from the government is also very low quality as well. But hopefully with the new regime, we'll be able to see some new testing done on whole cannabis extracts and maybe get some more research on that. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Go ahead. My question is, how can we dispel the myth that marijuana is a gateway drug? Well, it's an excellent question. Any more panelists want to talk, tackle that one? I can do it too. Well, I tell you, it's a gateway drug to gangs getting involved in criminal activity. That, that it is a gateway drug. But, you know, I've heard this uh, comment, and it's often a comment from many law enforcement officials, especially that we're promoting the D.A.R.E. program, which uh, uh, I'll have you know, those of you that are from West Van, that's one of the first things I did as your chief constable was to ax the D.A.R.E. program here. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Some people were very upset uh, with that, but uh, I had to do it. Uh, but, uh, you know, in my experience in 31 years in policing, uh, you know, people that do try marijuana, that try some other drugs or something like that, um, I haven't really found it uh, per se a gateway drug. What I did find in you know, interviewing many people and getting involved in arresting many people was that when they went to their uh, marijuana uh, trafficker, and you, know, you can just go down to the Victory Square area and you can find someone, but what they found was uh, some of the traffickers who you know, exploited some of the users uh, where they didn't have any marijuana to sell, but they had some crack cocaine to sell. And they actually sold it or talked the individual into using that particular drug. And, you know, of course, they did get involved in that. And if you look at some of the ethnographic studies, especially in the United States, you'll find that that is a very common occurrence is where the drug traffickers actually get the people going to a different drug where they can um, perpetuate their profits. Years ago, I used to believe that it was a gateway drug. Now I've come to realize that alcohol is the gateway. These kids try alcohol before they try marijuana. Well, and, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I, I was just going to oh. add to that. I'm Philippe yeah. Lucas. I'm with the Center for Addictions Research in British Columbia. And most of my research focuses on cannabis as a substitute for other substances. And I just, uh, I've, I've just did a presentation in Washington, D.C. called Cannabis the Exit Drug. And after 10 years of working at a medical cannabis dispensary, I used to hear stories about people who had medical cannabis prescriptions for HIV AIDS or hepatitis C, but were because they'd gone it through injection drug use. But they were actually using cannabis to stay away from those drugs of abuse. And so over the last few years, I've been doing polling of medical cannabis patients and of uh, the general population. And, and studies uh, more and more are showing that cannabis it's actually, for a lot of people, a substitute to these other harsher substances. So I think that we're going to get a real live experiment happening in Colorado and Washington over the next few years. As people gain legal access to cannabis, I don't think we're going to see a huge rate in, uh, and change in usage rates. What we're going to see, I think, is as people get a choice of going to a cannabis cafe as opposed to an alcohol-based outlet, which is our de facto thing that you do now in the evenings, 
you're actually going to see a shift in behaviors that's going to lead to positive health outcomes. You're going to see a reduction in alcohol use and alcohol-related violence, drinking and driving, domestic violence, et cetera, and potentially a shift away from harder drugs of abuse towards cannabis and with a net public health benefit in terms of uh, public health costs and public health savings. So I think that cannabis, we need to stop looking at it as a gateway drug, which is, as you suggest, long been discounted by science. Uh, there's just no evidence of that and start looking at it as an exit drug to, to addiction and abuse. No, that's an excellent point. For many people, cannabis could be a, a gateway to a more normal life away from other substances. And just quickly to add to that, we, we generally respond to that gateway theory saying it's kissing, a gateway to s &M, right? <laughs> just asking. <laughs> it can lead to dancing also. <laughs> That's right, it could lead. I wanted to comment on the, the, one of those really big questions that came up here and always comes up, which is what stops the politicians in the light of the polls? And um, many of you know me, my name is Steve Finley, I am a associate member, and that means a civilian non-law enforcement supporter of LEAP, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. And I realized listening to this, one reason why the politicians maybe aren't doing what you would think would be logical for them to do, put aside any politicians who are bought and paid for, there's probably a few of those, but for the others, politicians would look at two things. One is how many people hold a certain side of the issue, but the other thing that the politicians would look at is how important is that particular issue to the voter compared to other issues the voter's aware of? And I think that the politicians perceive that for the public in general, even if 60, 75 percent of them support legalization, the politicians perceive that they support it, but this isn't one of the voters big issues. And I believe the politicians are right. I believe that the vast majority of people, even if when you ask them, they'll say, yes, I support legalization, I don't think they have any idea how massive the damage of prohibition is. And I think before the politicians will start to move, all of us have to educate our friends and the people we're in touch with and make sure they really understand that the damage done by this whole prohibition thing is far more enormous than they think. And it's far more expensive, it's far more costly in terms of crime, it's far more costly in terms of health. And people, voters I think in general, are drastically underestimating all that. Does that, is that a possible explanation? I think that makes sense to me. And I, I would add to that that uh, when marijuana prohibition came in, if, if it had come in now, if cannabis was, was widely used and they tried to ban it now, we would see all those harms that have developed quite quickly. But because when cannabis was banned, nobody was really using it, it took a long time before we got to the point where we are now. So now all of us, our whole lives, have lived under cannabis prohibition. And so it seems sort of normal and natural. That's the way things have always been. It's just the way it is. Whereas alcohol prohibition, when it was brought in, alcohol was already widely used. People saw very quickly how much worse things were getting in their society. And hey, a few years ago, we had some problems with alcohol, but it wasn't as bad as what's going on now. And I think that, that you know, the frog in the boiling water metaphor that, that we've had, that, that people don't recognize how things are. They really don't, don't see the harms that prohibition of marijuana has caused. And we only really notice that when they leap out at us, when we see gang violence or we see certain bad things happening. But there's a lot of those harms that are, that are present all the time. Anybody else want to address that at all? Or? All right, take another question. Hi, um, my name's Robin and I'm a resident of West Van. And um, I'm just here because I saw this on Facebook. So Facebook gets a lot of uh, sort of criticism, but it's great for this because mm -hmm. I found my way here. And I just want to say what a great panel. You guys, just awesome to see, have you guys all, all do this. Um, and I'm just, I can't believe how empty this room is in a, you know, in a, in a city here this big. And I, I'm guessing it's because any one of us who might have like read about it, everybody's busy, but I just read about it a couple days ago. And so that was kind of late. I, I'm, I was able to fit it in. Um, and not that I'm trying to criticize that for, for finding out late, maybe uh, the information was, has been out for a long time. But um, the other thing is I think, I know many people in West Van because I, I I grew up here, I was born in, in uh, Vancouver, and 
a lot of my friends have kids who I think um, the stigma of it being illegal stops a dialogue about it. And um, so, you know, people probably would hesitate to come here tonight because they're like, oh, okay, well, if you're going to an event where they're talking about an illegal thing, you know, um, then, you know, you might get, you know, pointed out, you know, identified as someone who might smoke marijuana, that sort of thing. So it's, I guess my question is, when I speak to my friends, and, and I guess I want to ask Cash this, this question is, um, you know, are they worrying too much about the stigma of it? You know, like are the, are the police, um, you know, trying to pick on casual users or people who are, you know, accepting of it, but, uh, you know, they know it's illegal, so they're not admitting to it, that sort of thing. I mean, I think that's a, that's a real problem is that, that um, you know, we don't want to be seen to be breaking the law. We want to be good people, and therefore, you know, people hesitate. So thus, we've got a, a you know, not a very full room. Um, so. Yeah, let me just uh, address that and share a bit of a story when I was a chief over here in West Van. And People are uncomfortable uh, talking about it, uh, but we had a very, very unfortunate death of a, uh, I think she was a 14 or 15 year old girl, high school girl uh, here in West Vancouver. And uh, the parents were devastated and they came to see me. And uh, you even talked to the coroner, we couldn't determine the cause of death. She was uh, an outstanding student, um, had a great, group of friends, um, they said, please help us, you know, parents crying in my office, and, uh, you know, I just had a young daughter, so, God, I don't want anything to happen to my young daughter, so I put a lot of our resources in the police department on it to determine what actually took place that evening, and uh, we interviewed over 200 students here in West Vancouver to to determine what happened. And uh, I remember the uh, head of the uh, investigation section coming and giving me an update. And they were asking the questions to the kids of, uh, you know, who's uh, taking drugs, who's smoking marijuana. And the kids said to the officers, well, the question should be who is not taking drugs or smoking marijuana. So through uh, a, a length of interviews and, and gathering that data, uh, it was quite prevalent to me that the drug use of uh, marijuana and ecstasy was at a higher rate, a frequency rate, here in West Vancouver than it was when I was in charge of some of the inner city schools in Vancouver. The, the drug use, the frequency was higher, you know, albeit, uh, the students here weren't committing crimes to support the drugs that they wanted to take, similar to the inner city um, children. So certainly that was a problem, but in many of them, uh, the parents, uh, when they were growing up, when they went to college, and you know this is one of the most affluent neighborhoods in all of Canada, and one of the highest education rates here in West Vancouver, um, they smoked marijuana, and it was acceptable at that time. Um, you know, when you look at um, their children now, and they're, you know, they're smoking marijuana, most people grow out of smoking marijuana. We have uh, police officers that are policing your streets right now that when they went to high school, when they went to college, they smoked marijuana. It wasn't a gateway drug for them to s get into something else. But the stigma of it being illegal is still a particular problem. And that's something that needs to be addressed. And you're right, is to go out and talk to everyone you can. And, you know, Dana, do whatever you can to get the message out to encourage people to come out and have this discussion. Uh, this is the place to have the discussion, to learn more about it, to have that uh, education piece. And I think you'll start to see the tide turn. I would add to that that I often have people who are afraid to sign and register with our group. Oh, if the police get that list, they'd love to get that. And I'm like, what are they going to do with that? Like, 
it's not like they don't have a long list of grow-ups they haven't gotten to yet. I don't think even the most, you know, anti-marijuana police officer is out there trying to find more pot smokers on a list so they can go bust them. But certainly people have told me when I was on tour around the province, when I was in like Sparwood and Fernie, oh, these are mining towns and they've just introduced a random drug testing on all the employees. Someone comes here, they get marked as a marijuana user, they could lose their job or they could, and people often have challenges with their children or losing their children or those kind of issues. And so there is a fear. And certainly I would expect that when we get all our signatures together, the vast majority of those who end up signing are not gonna be marijuana users, just simply those who who want to change the law or see the harm in that. But there is definitely a fear and a stigma around, around this conversation and around being involved. And I've often had people come to me for years and saying, thanks for doing what you're doing. I can't say anything because da, 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 I've got a job or a family or something that I can lose, but I'm glad you're doing it. Even though I'm not going to support you openly, I'm just going to whisper my support to you when no one's looking. But that happens a lot, and, uh, and I, so when, when we get to the point of breaking through that, I think it's going to change. And I think the idea of medical marijuana is also helping to break that stigma, because you call it, or if someone's a medical marijuana user, it's seen differently, that they have a medical Sounds need, and there's a much yeah. broader. Yeah. And in my opinion, really, all, medical, all marijuana use is medical in some form or another, and that you're making yourself feel better, you're relaxing, you're improving your health in those kind of ways, or you're substituting another more dangerous substance. But that stigma definitely exists. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it is a challenge we have to overcome. And, uh, and I think the way to do that is to try to be as open as you can. And to try, if you use cannabis, be a responsible kind of cannabis user and be a good example to those. And if you don't use cannabis, don't be judgmental of those who do and try to make that openness there for that kind of dialogue to happen. But, uh, and you know, I'll say, when I started doing this 20 years ago, I didn't expect that I'd be on a panel with chiefs of police and academics and politicians and that kind of thing. And certainly having those kind of figures coming out, having all the people that have come out over the last uh, you know, year or so, largely thanks to the Stop the Violence campaign, I think helps open up that dialogue. Because if you've got attorney generals and mayors and politicians and academics talking about it, it makes it easier for regular people to bring up the discussion without necessarily putting that stigma on themselves. But it's absolutely a challenge we have to overcome, that whole stigma aspect. Right, yeah. Yeah, I think most, most people have tried it. Uh, most people tried it in school or college, as you're saying, and then they don't now because they have kids and they want to be a good example, but they actually, they don't really have a big problem with it, and yet they can't say to their kids, they can't say to their kids they've ever tried it, or, I mean, maybe some do and some don't, but I mean, it's a, it's a sticky issue, you know, they, they don't want to encourage it, they don't want to say to their kids, well, I did it and when I was in grade 12, but I don't want you doing it, because that's hypocritical. So then they have to say, I you know nothing, or I didn't do it, or uh, this it's morning. A tough, it's a tough I, I was reading in the, in the Toronto Star this morning. There was an article saying new study shows that you shouldn't be honest with your kids about your marijuana use. But the issue, the reason they said that was because it'll make your kids think marijuana is less harmful, and that was seen as a, as a negative consequence. But it seems more like it's just an accurate understanding of what marijuana is. They might find out that marijuana is not really that bad. Well, I don't know if that's necessarily a negative consequence, but a lot of parents, I think, do struggle with those kind of issues as yeah. to what to tell their kids and how to deal with that. And you don't want your kids outing you in school or bringing your medical marijuana to class or anything like that. That yeah. also causes problems. But, uh, but the fact is, the vast majority of Canadians have used marijuana. The vast majority of Canadians support legalization of marijuana, especially here in British Columbia. And, uh, and I find, you know, even now, even as a public figure, I'm out, I was getting a new suit a couple of days ago, and they asked me, what do you do? And I'm like, well, I sell marijuana for a living. And immediately, for the whole rest of the hour, we're all talking about marijuana. They're all supportive, telling me about their friends and family that have medical need. Not a single person ever says anything. But even I have a little, like, do I want to bring this up right now? Like, right. even though I'm, you know, Mr. Marijuana or whatever, <laughs> I still have that kind of fear about approaching that subject in certain situations. And yet, when I do, like, invariably, it's positive response. People are like, oh, I'm glad you brought that up. I have a bunch of questions about this that I want to ask you. Right. And, and so, uh, so I think if you break through that stigma, you find often a very positive reception. Right. Cool. Okay. Thanks. Right, thank you. And thank you so much for being here. Thank you. In, I'll, I'll just maybe add um, a point about um, sort of unintended consequences and use uh, of cannabis by young people is that people don't realize that when you make something illegal, and this is really well described, you know, you create a forbidden fruit phenomena where you know you get these hip hop artists and others glamorizing the use of cannabis because it's illegal. We've created a whole cultural framework around this 
because it's illegal. You know, imagine if we could go back in time and just make it a silly little thing that some people did and, you know, yeah, definitely don't use it and alcohol together and be driving and, you know, things like that, but not creating this huge thing about it. Um, prevalence of use would probably be much lower. So when we're talking about um, young people and their use of it in communities like this, um, I, you know, people need to start talking about the fact that just by making it illegal, it compels young people to be interested in it. Hey, you're probably right. If we did that, I wouldn't have a job. My name is Jeremiah Vanderbilt. I'm the editor of Cannabis Culture Magazine. <laughs> um, but that's true, I think. It definitely adds to the cultural mystique of the whole thing, having it illegal. But um, I just wanted to, first of all, say thank you very much to the panelists for coming here today and for Dana Larson for all his hard work on this campaign. And I really do support the Sensible BC campaign. I think it's fantastic. But it seems to me that if we had a few MLAs here in the province willing to go to bat for us and put forward a bill that would do much the same type of thing, um, we probably wouldn't have to have a long ballot initiative process to do all this. So I don't know where we could find anybody like that. Uh, but I have a question for Mr. Heed. Uh, maybe he would consider, and uh, I'm asking him that, if he would consider putting a forward a bill to do this or proposing a bill to do something like this. The, and if the, he could help push that with others maybe or something. The legislature's not in session right now. I'm oh, not sure it's coming back. Even uh, if you wanted to try a private member's bill, I don't think you'd have the opportunity. No, right. we, have, we have one more week left next week, and then that's it. So. Uh, not hopeful. If we put it, you know, we'd be wasting our, our time because you put forward a private member's bill and it just dies on the order paper. It goes nowhere. Mm -hmm. uh, so your best bet is to, uh, you know, regardless of who the government is on uh, when you wake up May 15th, that's if you're going to use that tactic, which you probably want to use a comprehensive approach to change the laws here in Canada, is you're going to have to pressure whoever the MLAs are elected mm -hmm. and get on it right away. But right now, it's way too late. To it seems like to me it would, it would be better to have one than to not have one, you know what I mean? Not, not with you necessarily, but with whatever government is there. And as you say, yeah, I guess that's something we need to work on with the new government that's there as well. Hopefully, uh, they'll be a little bit more on our side when it comes to these issues. We'll find out. But. We will be launching a campaign to go talk to your new MLA shortly after the election. I would love it if we could have every MLA in the province getting numerous phone calls and appointments from people asking them about Sensible BC and about marijuana once the election. I mean, we should be bringing it up during the election campaign as well, but right. once our new MLAs are chosen and perhaps a new government is chosen, I hope that the people involved in this campaign, we can put a big effort to get out there and talk to all of our MLAs first thing with the new regime or however the election comes out and, uh, and make sure they know what's an issue because that's, that's a big part of it. But uh, So we do have many MLAs on, on, on from both parties. Uh, you know, Nicholas Simons came and spoke at our, our first event and uh, and we've got other MLAs in the NDP and the Liberals and certainly the Greens and maybe even a couple of Conservatives. I don't know, maybe not too many in the BC Conservative Party, but we got a few uh, Libertarian types in the Federal Party there. And, uh, and it's really a nonpartisan issue, ultimately. It's not really a right or a left-wing issue. It's something that people from all sides of the spectrum you know, it's not, there are not a lot of things where the Fraser Institute and NDP policy are, are, are aligned like that, right? There are, and the Liberals, of course, and all the other parties. Like, it's something that really crosses over all those different, uh, different things. But nothing precludes you from making this an election issue. You know, we'll be going to the polls soon. We've got, you know, a couple months. You know, if you're going to all candidates meetings or something like that, or you have an opportunity to talk to someone that's running to be an MLA here in the province of British Columbia, Nothing precludes you from making that the issue for that person. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you very much, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kat. Uh, no one knows who the heck I am for the most part, but I've done some film work. And the more I think about this issue, the more I think um, just how sheltered the top politicians are, how they can never seem to be held accountable. And we can write a million letters to our MPs and MLAs, and have you noticed nothing happens when we do that? Um, we get told, oh, it's not our jurisdiction, you know, <laughs> it's the United Nations jurisdiction, you know, the end when we go up the ladder. And, you know, nothing ever gets done. So I'm thinking I'm, it's about time to make a Michael Moore style movie, kind of like uh, when he tried to chase down, who was it, Lee Iacocca? somebody, the Chrysler dude, way back 20 years ago, um, and how impossible it is to hold these people accountable for the crap that comes out of their mouths. 
um, just the lie that it's a gateway drug, the lie that if you legalize it, it'll make it easier for children to get it. Um, and not only that, um, I've just noticed that most, if not all, uh, documentaries that um, uh, are more pro-marijuana, more positive on the subject, they keep showing the cannabis community as a bunch of, you know, twirling hippies who aren't very well groomed and, you know, I'd like to show the real cannabis community, you know, people who look more like me, people who look more like people, the people in the room here. Uh, I know a lot of people who wear suits and who are self-made millionaires who smoke pot. Okay, so... Get them I, to donate to the campaign. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Good luck. Um, <laughs> that's just the thing. They all, they're all like Christy Clark. They all go, oh, hee, 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 I did it a long time ago, and ha, 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 and I'm not going to talk about it anymore, and they run away, and they, they don't want to admit they do it um, because of the stigma that's attached to it. And... You know, um, there's a word I'm going to use that's probably going to make everybody in this room hate me um, or dislike me, but um, I'll <laughs> preface it by saying that uh, it's the second definition of nigger uh, on the freedictionary.com. Uh, it's a group that anyone, or it's any group that society sanctions the repression of who doesn't deserve it. And um, if you think about how people are getting drug tested and, you know, they could lose their jobs and they, they can't even get into the United States if, if they've tested positive for drugs and they're pretty, pretty much half the big companies in the United States uh, randomly drug test their employees. And if anyone tests positive for pot, they're gone, out of a job, a uh, criminal record, that stigma that's attached to them. If that's not a nigger, I'm sorry, you know, what is? You can't get a job because you smoke pot. You could never run for high office if you admit you are a, a, a present day user, although you could, you know, head off to the bar or home and drink half a bottle of whiskey that night and, and you know, be as successful as you want. So I just, I have these frustrations. I would like to, get some resources together to make this, uh, to make another documentary, but I, I don't know how popular that's going to be, considering there have been a lot of documentaries on pot and, and how wrong the laws are. Uh, and that said, I just have a question about um, something I'm reading here. The Sensible Change Society is a registered nonprofit, but donations are not tax deductible. At what point would donations be tax deductible? What does the society have to become? You need to be a charity to accept tax deductible donations and charities cannot engage in political work. So if we were a charity, we, the Sensible BC campaign could not be a charitable organization. You're very limited into what kind of political advocacy you can do as a charity. So as a nonprofit, we can happily accept your donations and we'll give you a good karma in return, but we cannot <laughs> give you a tax credit in return because we're doing a political campaign, unfortunately. But right. we still happily accept your donations and it does help you in your good karma in the long run. And I'll also address what you talked about in terms of the racial issues there, because certainly well, not, if you look not, at the origins, well, racial. no, you weren't, you, but, but if you look at the origins of, of cannabis prohibition, it was entirely about racial groups and about using this as a means to put certain racial groups outside. In, in Vancouver, it was more against the Chinese originally. In the U.S., it was more against blacks, but it's always against marginalized racial groups mm -hmm. that these laws are brought in. And, uh, and to get them out of the labor pool or to make it so they can't vote or things like that. And certainly in the U.S. it's more prevalent, but here it's certainly prevalent as well. There's definitely a racial dynamic to that. And I'm curious actually if, if any in the panel wants to talk about that a little bit. Does your experience maybe cash as a police officer um, I mean, you're only in certain areas, but uh, do you think there's any kind of, like a First Nations person is more likely to get charged for marijuana or someone who's got darker skin? Maybe not so much in West Vancouver, but in British Columbia as a whole, or would you have any thoughts on that? Well, I, and it's no surprise what I'm going to say, there is profiling that does take place. And uh, if you don't fit in uh, with the norm of that particular neighborhood and you're doing something which is not correct, um, you know, uh, against the law, uh, you're most likely going to be charged for that versus uh, someone that 
is part of that neighborhood, fits into that neighborhood, uh, is not necessarily going to get charged. So if you're an, an outsider coming into the neighborhood and you don't fit in, you're doing something illegal, there is a, po a good possibility you're going to get charged. All right. Do you have anything else, sir? Well, just do you think there would, Dana, do you think there would be any room for a movie that uh, is basically <laughs> some unknown idiot running around trying to get accountability out of politicians for one thing and, and for another thing, rounding up a whole pile of people who have lost their jobs simply because of pot. Is there, has there any, been anything done like that yet? There's I, a lot of, there's a lot of marijuana documentaries that have been out over the past few years, although I'm not that. aware of anyone like that where they're somebody sort of trying to corner politicians on camera and get them to talk about the issue or, or that kind of thing. That could be interesting, you know, it would depend on the details, but uh, yeah, go for it. It could be a lot of fun. And certainly, you know, profiling people that have been harmed by prohibition, especially in British Columbia, would be something I would love to see, uh, taking a look at some of those individuals and how this affects their lives, because too often people are complacent. And if you live in Vancouver and you enjoy marijuana, it's very easy to pretend that marijuana is legal. If you, if you know what you're doing, you can get it easily. There's places you can go and smoke it safely. Police officers are unlikely to harass you over it if you do it in a you know, reasonably responsible way. Other parts of the province, it's a lot different, of course, and enforcement can really vary quite a bit. And uh, so I think it's good to bring that to people's attention, that the tolerance we enjoy in Vancouver is really limited to the city, and that may not last forever. Certainly a change in policy, it's not a law, it's merely a policy. And a change in policy or a change in municipal government, we could see that be done very differently, uh, certainly. So. Yeah, I think to get more material, I, I will take this North America wide. I would not stop here because because of what you just said about it being so accepted already and people just go, it's just pot, who cares kind of thing. I want to take it all over the United States where people, some people really are, you know, pent up about it. If you want to pursue that, talk to me afterwards. We can chat about that. I might have some sure. ideas for you. Did you have a question behind you? Yeah, thank you. Did you have a question? We'll Our take your question and then first. yours, and then okay, that'll then. be it for the night because we're just after nine o'clock now, so, I think. So. so I have a really quick question for you. Uh, you had said you had several different of these forums in different places, and I was wondering if, like, say, if you had a forum on, in Grandview Woodlands or someplace like that, whether you would have, like, an overflowing full house because of the interest in pot in those parts, like East Vancouver, let's say. Well, maybe. I don't know. I, I think it's challenging, you know. Uh, I think I, we rented too big of a room for tonight's event, but uh, it varies. I've seen events with a couple of hundred people come out. I've seen ones with smaller crowds. I don't know if there's more interest in East Vancouver or not, really. I mean, I think people are interested in this issue all around the province. Uh, certainly, there's a lot of marijuana-friendly businesses in East Van and kind of a zone of tolerance. True. There's more dispensaries yeah. and more vapor lounges and that kind of thing in yeah, East Van than the drive. rest of the city. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, uh, but you know, for this campaign to succeed, we've got to get people from every single district in the province. All 85 districts have to come on board with 10% of the registered voters. And so that's why I was traveling around earlier, taking it to small communities, and that's why we're trying to do these events all around the Lower Mainland, because we've got to get every single district. We need volunteers and organizers in every single nook and cranny in this province in order for us to get the signatures that we need. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we will be in North Van on Saturday. Yeah, we have some good, good, good and different panelists lined up for that, that night. Uh, mine's just more of a statement. I just wanted to say thank you to everyone who's taking the chance uh, and showing your face and speaking for everyone. I face over 4,000 medicinal users every single day and I want like to speak on their behalf. These people are scared. They're scared that their dispensary is not going to be there in a year from now, that when they cross the water to come over to North Vancouver, that their medicine might be taken because it's RCMP instead of the tolerance that we see in Vancouver. So we need to push this. We need an umbrella for everybody to feel safe. And these people, they don't want to go back to the alley where, you know, they don't know what they're getting. They don't know if it's laced. They just want to live a normal life, feed their children, you know, not have to be drooling on Demerol and other medicines all day long. They want to be a functional part of society, have safe access to safe medicine. And I just want to thank you, most of you, you know, the doctors. I see a lot of your patients. And I just want to say thank you for showing your face. And everybody, it's really sad to see in one of the richest uh, postal codes in Canada that this room isn't full because we have a lot of taxpayer pull and a lot of um, enforcement here. 
So you need to tell your friends, we all need to do this on an individual level. We all need to get the word out there and break the stigma. It, it goes back to what Cash said. It's not that West Vancouver isn't using marijuana. It's, it was one of the most, you know, places where it is used. It's that we need to break the stigma. These people will accept, and they are saying that they will sign the bill, but why aren't they showing their face here tonight? Because of the stigma. It's wrong, it's wrong, let's change it. It's your grandmother, it's your sister, it's your brother. It's everybody who needs this medicine in a different form, in a pill form, in food, in a smoke. They just need access to it safely and they can function with their lives and they're not harming anybody else and it's not a gateway. How many people are sitting around medicating themselves saying, let's go get some cocaine? I think I've seen that more in a group full of people drinking alcohol. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so what's that? Okay, well, be quick, be quick. We've registered close to 15,000 people so far, and uh, we need, we're hoping to register up to 400,000 in advance of the campaign. That's how many we're going to need around the province. We may not get all 400,000 in advance, but we want to have as big a head start as possible so that we can get a lot of support. But we're about to do some things that will put those numbers up quite a bit. But uh, yeah, we're at around 15,000 people right now that have actually registered online. That's coming from members when you get the signatures. That is correct, Jody. Yes, we have a 90-day period to collect the signatures. You have a limited amount of time to do that. So this is all pre-registration time. We're going to start that 90-day clock in September, October, November of this year. At that time, we'll need volunteers to go out. And ideally, we can tell our volunteers, look, here's the 100 people in your neighborhood who have already registered their support. So we do all the door knocking and street canvassing and going to events over the next six months. When September comes, ideally, we can just send our volunteers, of which I hope some of you in this room will become some of those volunteers. We send them to those places where people have already registered and get, and get everybody in place that way. I know the support is out there. You know, we have far more than 10% in every registered, in every district. Uh, support, but the challenge is getting the physical signatures, getting the bodies to those people, getting them to sign those forms in time. That procedurally is just a very big effort. And like I often say, once we, if we can succeed in that part, we're going to win the referendum. I have, we have the campaign, but I have very little doubt that we would win a referendum today on this legislation. The procedural aspect of getting the signatures that we need is very challenging. And so that starts this coming September. Uh, I don't really know about that. I suspect that they're not going to be giving out very many licenses. I would encourage people who think they might be able to get one to apply, but I'm certainly not applying. And uh, I, uh, I don't know, it's kind of a separate question in a way, but uh, I do think we need to be working on a better set of rules for medical patients. If we legalize cannabis for everybody, that should hopefully solve a lot of the questions around medical access. But uh, I absolutely support you know, a patient's right to grow their own medicine, patient's right to have someone else to grow their medicine for them in a proper way. And, uh, and we need to ensure that the most sick and vulnerable among us who need marijuana medicine are able to get it when they need. And, I, yeah, and thanks to our online audience. So uh, just before we go, we've got some of these cards floating around outside. You might be given one of these on your way out. You can fill out here what you thought about tonight, give us a little feedback, how you heard about the event. You can tear this little part off. We're going to have a follow-up meeting on Sunday, March 10th at 3.30 at the John Braithwaite Community Center Shoreline Room at 145 West 1st Street, North Van. That'll be a volunteer organizing meeting, so if you want to get involved, you want to make a difference, you want to make some new friends, learn about how you can help change the laws here in BC, then take this little thing home with you and come back to the John Braithwaite Community Center 3.30 on Sunday, March 10th. Thank you all for being here. Thanks for our panel. I've got each of you a gift certificate from Chapters Books. And uh, that's it for the night. Thank you very much.